Um, welcome to our new series of CPD, CPD in 43, with our first speaker, um, Nick Beeching from Moy Materials. Um, this will be something that we're running uh, from a Wessex, uh, Syat Wessex perspective from uh, now until at least the end of next year. Um, so please do keep an eye out for all of our events. We have this and we've also created another series which is in discussion with. Um, we'll, we'll show you a couple of events that we've got coming up in uh, the uh, next couple of weeks as well. And we'll slowly start to filter out uh, all of the events that we have coming up over the next uh, months uh, 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 during 2021. Um, so adieu, I will hand, that, hand this over to Nick and uh, we will be here in the background. If there's any questions or anything like that, please do comment is needed. If you're unable to, please email if there's something pertinent. Otherwise, please do sit back and enjoy. And uh, I'll speak to you on uh, towards the end of the um, event. OK, uh, well, first of all, thank you for turning up today. Greatly appreciated. Like I said, my name is Nick Beeching from Moy Materials. Um, the presentation we're going to go through and then at the end um, I can take a quick Q&A if people have time. If not, I will also leave my email address on the very last slide. So if you have any questions that perhaps you don't want to ask in a public forum, please feel free to email me and I'll respond to you. Also, if you'd like a, um, a REBA certificate to prove attendance for today for your records, again, please email me after the presentation um, and I'll be more than happy to issue a certificate for you. So what we'll do now is I'm just going to turn my camera off. Um, I'll still leave the microphone on because there'd be no point in me being here. Uh, I'm going to share the presentation with you. OK, so the presentation today is a uh, guide to green roofing technology, and I hope that's what you're all here and expecting to see today. So just a little bit about Moy. Like I said, I'm not here to sell you anything today, simply because we just don't have the time and the time allotted today. But basically, we are a full system provider. So we do everything from metal decking, insulation, all different types of waterproofing system, green roof systems, which go on any of our waterproofing systems, which also we're going to discuss today in, in a bit more depth. Um, we do all sundry items as well, such as roof lights, full arrest systems, outlets, composite panels, etc. Some of the sectors that we work in, which you probably will be very familiar with, are educational, medical, pharmaceutical, commercial, agricultural, mixed use, IT processing um, and data centres. So what are the objectives for today? Well, hopefully we're going to hopefully try to clearly explain the technology available to, to, to green roof designers. Present this in a logic chain that you can apply to the design process. Um, to alert you people of challenges green roofs can present and hopefully to um, give you the confidence and, and knowledge to avoid dif difficulties that can arise from through an experience of specifying green roofing. So first thing I suppose we need to do is say is the, the, the common question we get asked is well, what actually is a green roof? Very simply um, a green roof is any roof upon which a vegetative layer is designed as the final roof finish can be described as a green roof. The key word here is designed. It has to be designed as a green roof. This clearly is not a green roof. This is just down to bad maintenance and husbandry. This has been left alone. It's, it's self seeded and it's grown. Obviously now you're getting water ingress. This building was never ever designed to have a green roof on it. So there's probably lots and lots of terminology that you've heard about green roofing. And what I try to do here as a specifier and a designer of green roofing is trying to convey two simple types of green roofing um, and try and get rid of all the terminology. So they give you the confidence to specify green roofing. And they very simply break down into two very distinct types. So the first one is an intensive green roof. So an intensive green roof, you need to think of it like your back garden at home. So you have a soil depth of about 300 mil, gonna have a high dead load, it will require irrigation. It's like your garden at home. You need to water it in the summer months. You need to weed it. There are limitless planting choices. The world is your oyster, so you can have pretty much what you want on your roof. Um, and they will accept foot traffic. They're great communal areas. The other end of the, the spectrum, if you like, is an extensive green roof, which is probably more commonly specified in the UK at the moment. Um, these tend to be things like your sedums. So they are very shallow. They soil depth of about 50 mil. Very lightweight. Uh, on the wettest day of the year, you're probably looking at about a 125 kilograms a meter squared. They seldom require watering, but I will come into a bit more of that in the presentation. Very low maintenance once they're established, 
But like I just said, you are looking at things like sedums and mosses. Um, they are not great for traffic roof areas. They have very fragile root systems. If you tread on them, it sends the roots into shock and it will just kill the planting. So what are some of the engineering benefits of the green roofing? They can increase the lifespan of the membrane. So with any kind of waterproofing membrane, what you're trying to do is protect it from the elements and from UV degradation. So obviously by burying it, you're effectively putting the best sun cream on you can and it can sustain substantially increase and sustain um, the service level of your roof. They're great for rainwater attenuation and flood control, so especially if you're specifying in an area where you have a suds policy and you need to control the flow of water that's actually going into perhaps a Victorian um, existing rainwater system. They work fantastically as an acoustic barrier both ways. They can keep noise in and out. Obviously, they can provide additional thermal insulation. By putting a nice mound of soil around your building, you can keep it at a more uh, constant temperature all year round. And by doing that, you can have associated knock on effects as well, like reducing air conditioning costs. Some of the environmental and uh, aesthetic benefits of a green roof. First one, I think the most obvious one really is it can enhance the visual amenity of any building. I mean, anyone would like to look over a nice green, pleasant designed area rather than a grey, dull, flat roof. They can significantly reduce the urban um, heat island effect, and I'm sure you all know about that. And if you don't, I can quite happily answer some questions about that later on in the presentation. Great for providing habitats for insects and birds, encouraging um, local species back to an area. Again, great when you're going for planning applications. And again, more prevalent at the moment, I suppose, is improved air quality, sucking in the carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. It's got to be a, a, a bit of a benefit for everyone. So here we see here, I'm just gonna put my laser pointer on so you can just see what I'm looking at. Right, okay. So here we have here, first of all, excuse the Janet and John drawing, but they do serve a purpose. They're quite simplistic, but it just kind of gets the idea across. So this is basically a typical section detail of a green roof. So if I start at the bottom here, then basically what this one is, this is a, 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 a built up roofing system. So we have your deck here, whatever specified, your insulation board. Then the red layer here is your waterproofing layer. On top of that, the yellow layer here is a, what they call a, um, a protection fleece. Then you have your drainage board. Then you have your filter fleece, then the soil to whatever depth you need. Um, and then you grow, um, you grow medium and then whatever planting scheme you have on top. To the left hand side here, the blue line here is actually a metal retaining edge. And in here is the gravel infill that deals with basically fire breaks um, and obviously drainage of the system. So green roof build ups, what I'm going to show you now is a very quick diagram, but if you can get this diagram in your head and understand the basic principles, as long as you understand this, you can pretty much specify any type of green roof. So what we do is we start with a deck. Then we have a waterproofing membrane. Then a protection fleece. Then a drainage and reservoir board then your filtration layer. Then you grow medium. And then a vegetative layer. And if you can understand that basic principle, that's all you need for green roofing. So typical intensive green roofs. This is what an intensive green roof looks like. This is Smithfield's apartment. It's 13 storeys high. Um, it's a residential block. And um, from the ground below, you would never, ever know this amenable space is there. Um, it's about 3000 square metres of roof space, which is very, is habitable and usable. usable. Um, through the doorway here, there's a barbecue area. It's lawned, as you can see. There's some planting schemes around the other side. There's a children's play area. Now, this is maintained all year. The residents pay a, um, a local maintenance company that come up and do all the maintenance all year round to keep this as it is. On the other end of the spectrum, like we're saying about the sedum, the light wave roof structures, this is an extensive green roof. This is typically what one will look like. Just as a footnote for this one, this is actually on a hospital building where it was a, a grey a single ply roof that was specified. But there's been some studies done um, a few years ago now where they were shown that um, patients that were overlooking green and pleasant environments tended to recover quicker than, than people that were sort of looking under sort of unimaginative dull um, scenes out of their windows. On the back of this, the, um, the planning team for the project managed to uh, apply for some additional funding, which they were um, they were awarded. Um, we came back and later on and we retrofitted a green roof on to, onto the extension. So again, it just looks a bit nice and looking at a, a grey roof. 
green roofing doesn't necessarily have to be on the flat roof. Here we can see it on a pitch roof or two here. So on the left hand side here, this is a service centre on a motorway and um, we can go and get your coffee and have your Braco Naturel. On the right hand side here is um, a domestic dwelling, two storey chalet type building. Now the slopes on these roofs, rule really the, the rule of thumb here is no more than 30 degrees. Anything more than 30 degrees, we need to start pinning the structures in, which you can do, but then you start to go into structures like living walls, which you're probably seeing quite regularly now on shopping centres and things. With the living, uh, with these type of structures, once you get past 30 degrees, you also need to bear in mind that you will need to provide some kind of irrigation and some kind of feeding um, on these roofs because rain, the rainwater, when it falls, because of the, the picture of the roof, will just run off and it won't have time to absorb the sort of nutrients and the moisture that it needs. So you just need to bear that in mind when you're going above 30 degrees. So some of the design considerations we're going to talk about. So first, we're going to talk about the selection of the planting scheme. We'll go through some of the irrigation and roof drainage, types of growing medium, the drainage and reservoir zones. We'll go through different types of waterproofing available to you, some insulation requirements and the choices. Um, and we'll go through subject types and dead loads as well. Now, the reason I put this slide like this in this order is that with typical with designing of, of roofing, we tend to work from the substrate up. What we try and do with green roofing is, is flip that on its head and actually we need to design a roof to support the planting scheme that you want so we need to design if you like a, a build that will sustain that plant life so we try and do it the other way so we design from the top up rather than um sorry from the top down rather than from the, the bottom up if that makes sense okay so substrates and um and, and dead loads so all the green roofs are compatible with concrete steel uh, and timber deck types Positive falls are not required, but they are recommended. Loads must be carefully checked against the capacity of your chosen deck type. And here's a really nice little table just to kind of give you a bit of an indication. So if you remember like the sedums that we showed you earlier, you're talking about, um, which is the lightweight structure, we're talking about a saw depth of about 50 mil. That's going to give you a growing height of a maximum of about 150 mil. So we work in thirds. So one third below, two thirds above. A wet weight on that one is about 125 kilograms a meter squared. So that's going to give you a dead load of about 1.2 kilonewtons a meter squared. Most of you know who are on this presentation will know that majority of structures can take 1.2 kilonewtons with relatively ease. If we go to the other end of the spectrum and we're going to fully design roofs, we could have soil depths of easy in excess of 600 millimeters, which will give you a growing height of 10 meters. So we're talking about putting trees, you know, fully growing trees on roofs. Wet weight of then, you nearly a ton of meters squared and that's nearly nine kilonewtons a meter squared so if we're going for these types of schemes you are going to be looking at reinforced steels reinforced structure concretes uh, i would advise structural engineers um, are involved with, with those kind of designs okay sorry as you can see i really do like my janet and john drawing so this is really about the different types of insulation so there's main three types of insulation that we specify within green roofing so the first type on the left hand side is a cold roof and a cold roof is exactly that it has no insulation so have your deck whatever you spot you're specifying and here we have the waterproofing layers just denoted in in, in, in two different bl uh, blue lines the middle one is a warm roof this is a traditional what we call a traditional built-up roof so you have your deck whatever you specified then you have the purple line here which is a vapor control layer that deals with any moisture within the building then you have an insulation board typically a pir board that kind of thing and then you have your waterproofing system on top what we're finding more and more common now, especially with green roofing, is an inverted roof. So we have um, your deck, whatever you specified. Then you have your waterproofing membranes. Then you have your insulation. So that would probably be it could be an extruded polystyrene, um, an EPS type board, rock wall type product. And then on top of that, you'd have either your ballast, paving or a green roof. So that's the main three types of insulation that we need to consider when specifying green roofs. So what are some of the waterproofing considerations? First one then is the construction program. How long is it left exposed? This is going to sound really, really obvious, but um, a lot of green roofing, waterproofing membranes are not UV stable because by nature they are designed to be buried. So if you have a long build program, and usually when you find them big podiums, the green roofing is the very, very last thing that gets done literally before practical completion. So 
if you've got a build program where you've weathered the podium and you still got another six months to a year before you even think about greening it, you need to make sure that the membrane you're specifying is UV stable. Otherwise, what will happen is the UV will attack it and you end up with a big perforated tea bag on your hand and you're just going to have leaks absolutely everywhere. Another thing that sounds really, really um, obvious is root penetration resistance. Ask the question, is it root inhibiting? All of our products have a copper sulfite solution added in at manufacturer. Um, basically, that singes the, the root tips. What you've got to bear in mind with the root tips is the root tips, when they're growing, they're harder than diamonds and they can force themselves away relatively easily through most structures. So by having the sulfate in there, it singes the root and it stops it from growing downwards and encourages it to spread across the membrane rather than going through it. Another one which will come on to the next side is resistance mechanical damage. And this really does come on about how long is it going to be exposed for? Are you going to have um, dumper truck cranes workmen, you know, going over going over the area before it's buried? If so, you need to consider what type of membrane you're specifying. With all types of green roofing, I would say look at the warranties that you're being offered. Make sure that they're tested before they're buried. And, and when you specify, make sure you're choosing manufacturers that have a track record in doing green roofing. It is their business to be doing green roofing. There's loads of really good ones in the marketplace. Um, just a quick Google and you can find them very, very easily. Um, and again, also make sure that they're going to be involved with the process, that they're going to come out and do the testing and they are experienced and are qualified to do that for you. So here, this is what I just wanted to show you about, um, a, you know, during the construction phase. So as you can see here on this one, we've got a, a, a guy on a dumper truck who's loading the soil onto, onto the membrane. Now, why he's not directly on the membrane, they get, the best method of working is they kind of pour a bit of soil and they drive the truck onto that and then they pour some more soil and move along the roof. You know, I will live in the real world, you know, relatively that's not going to happen. They tend to just drive where they want to drive. So if you were specifying something like a single ply membrane on here, um, it, those tires would just tear that to shreds and you'd have you'd, you know, you'd have a leaking building on your hands. So what are your waterproofing options? So bitumen, I'm sure most of you are very, very familiar with bitumen, tends to be between sort of two and six mil thick per layer. It's robust and durable, it's tough as old boots, very, very quick to install. It's got a high resistance for chemical damage, as you just saw in the last slide. It's very, very cost effective. It's trust in certified. Most decent manufacturers will have full system BBAs and full system BBAs on green roof systems. And that's what you need to be looking for. It's OK having a system BBA, but if it's not a green roof system BBA, it's pretty much relevant. In the UK market, you'll come across two types of bitumen products, an SBS product, which is a styrene butyl styrene type, which is a bitumenous uh, polymer, and also an APP, which is exactly the same, but it's made of a plasticizer rather than a bitumenous product base. Next thing that we talked about is obviously um, single ply membranes. Again, they're very, very quick to install. They're lightweight. So if you are specifying late, lightweight structures and you are worried about the structural loading, single ply might be an answer for you, especially if you've got large span areas or perhaps um, thinner metal gauge decking or uh, glue lamb cross laminated timber decking. Um, it's a good option. In the UK marketplace, again, you'll probably come across two types. So there's a PVC, which is sort of the commonly specified one in the UK, which is a polyvinyl chloride, and there's a TPO, which is a thermoplastic polyolefin. Try saying that after a few drinks. Um, the, the TPO is the PVC has sort of the nastier chemicals in it, if you like. Um, it's not very good for BREAM ratings and things like and green credentials if, if you're going for those kind of scoring systems. Whereas the TPO is completely inert. If you burn it, the only thing that comes off is water vapor, and it's 100% recyclable. So if you have specifying a TPO on a metal deck, um, you'll get an A++ BREAM rating, which is, you know, that's pretty good in anyone's eyes. Hot melt for podiums is another option for you. Um, hot melt systems tend to be three and five mil thick, very robust and durable, they're brilliant products, quick to install, um, very high resistance to mechanical damage. You can drive diggers and trucks on those. Very, very cost effective. They're trusted and certified. They've been around for a long, long time. Um, they do have full system BBAs. Coincidentally, with the BBAs, again, it's definitely the devil in the detail. So um, with our BBA, when we look at the durability statement on the, on the BBA, ours, it says that the um, the durability of the system is for the the life expectancy of the building. Now, that's 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 massively important. So if you're doing life cycle cost analysis and you're specifying a product that is designed to outlast your building that you're building, 
um, it's really going to help you with your life cycle costings. There's two main types in the UK market, first generation and second generation. First generation derived from um, the Canadian markets and basically it's made with bitumen and recycled car tires, believe it or not. You do need an agitated um, boiler on site with this. It needs to be constantly mixing it so that the rubber compound from the tires doesn't separate from the bitumenous mix. Um, so the boilers on that type of thing, they are quite costly and it is fairly labour intensive. The second generation, which is something that, that the self says Moy we, we specify, um, it has a polymer compound already made within the system. So you don't need any fancy boilers. You just heat it up in a normal boiler. It's very, very quick to install. Um, and we would always recommend if you're going to choose a hot melt system in terms of design speed application, second generation is definitely the, the one, uh, the choice out of the two. Reinforced liquids, again, you're probably already familiar with these. They've been around for quite a while in the UK marketplace. They are brilliant for roofs where you've got lots and lots of penetrations because they will seamlessly seal around anything. So if you think you've got a green roof that you're designing and on that you might have a handrail going around the edge, you might have a child's climbing frame, you might have um, some garden structures that need to be tied into the deck for obvious reasons for wind calculations and structural stability. So the best kind of liquids then can seamlessly seal around those like we do here and then the green system can then be put straight over the top so this roof here you can see here now actually has a seed and roof over it what you're seeing here is when it was weathered before the green roof went on just to show you that we can deal with with penetrations and again on this picture here this was a retrofit this was an, an existing building not a new build it was something that's being refurbished and a part of it they decided they'd like to put a green roof on as well um, they contacted us and again we've just devised them, not a problem we could do that um, this is the best this this is the best product for this type of situation so once you specify the, uh, your waterproofing la layer the next thing you need to consider about is the, the, the drainage and reservoir boards so first we need to determine is and ask ourselves is do we uh, do we require water retention um, and do we need to hold you know what kind of depth of soil are we using and then do you need to create a water reservoir or simply allow excess water to drain away? So you might want to hold the root, the water on the roof. So that might be because storm control for one, which is quite especially with suds policies, or it may be more to do with the fact that um, people want to use it as rainwater harvesting. So they might want to use it to flush internal environmentally friendly toilets, which is quite a common place at the moment. It might be because they want to harvest that rainwater so that they can then later on use it to actually water the, the, the roof itself. So this is what a drainage and reservoir board looks like once it's being installed. Um, they're not sexy by any means. They're just basically like egg trays and um, they slot together, as you can see here, they all clip together. And then when you get to funny edges, you literally just get some tin snips out and you just cut cut around the shape. The most important part here, though, is once they're installed, is if you can see here on the right hand side, this is the filtration fleece going down. It's really important that you put the filtration fleece on top of the drainage board. That way stops all the soil going into the holes of the drainage board and blocking up the drainage board. Obviously, if you block up the drainage board, the only problem is you're not actually going to be holding any water retention on that roof. So here I just want to show you is a, a, a drainage board again using a different scenario. So this is um, an inverted roof application. So the waterproofing is down here and here's an outlet. Then we have an inverted insulation board. Here's your drainage board. And then what I want to show you on here is he's got this huge, great big cast plant, uh, concrete planter being poured on here. And there's an outlet through here, which is perforated, that pick up, goes straight through and drains into the drainage board. So these drainage boards can take huge compressive strengths and distribute loads. Just a sort of a really for, 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 for the thought process. So, you know, if you're thinking about putting nice big granite planters, granite sets, heavy paving, not a problem. They can sit directly on these drainage boards. Here, what I want to show you is this is what you can be, can be done with drainage board to solve a problem. So this is a big podium. It's a European project um, that we've been involved with. This whole area that you can see here is a big podium and underneath it, there is retail shops and some parking. Uh, the problem with the contract at the time is they when they poured the concrete slab, they actually poured it flat by accident. They didn't mean to. They've the settlement, they got the figures wrong, I think, and um, they were panicking because it was zero falls. Well, we've come along and said, well, not a problem. We can deal with that. So we've waterproofed underneath. We put a drainage reservoir board, res reservoir board system in that holds all that water and can deal with the water. And now it's a really, really functional, usable space. So we've got a car turning circle on it. We've got some green lawns. We've got some kind of decorative planters that are going up 
some paving and pedestrian lighting. So green roofing can be really, really usable functional spaces. And you need to think about it, it does not necessarily just at roof level, but at podium, at balcony levels as well, works just as well. OK, so some of the growth, me, uh, growth uh, medium, if you like, the soil types and what you need to consider with the two. So with an intensive roof, so your grasses and your shrubs, you need a lightweight soil mixture with a high organic content. A clay content less than 10 percent by mass, and it must be from a clean source supplier. Why we specify as a clean source supply is that we don't want people taking all the building rubble and just putting it straight onto the roof. It's not good to sustain plant life. Extensive roofs, so you see them, you lightweight ones. Um, a lightweight with a low organic content. Needs to be inert mineral, and I'll come into why in a minute about that. And again, from a very clear, from a clean source supplier. Please don't just be, you know, putting the building rubble on your roofs. It, it, it won't sustain any life. So some of the properties that you need to consider with soil. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this because it literally is a presentation on its own and you will probably all fall asleep. So um, I'll just pick out a couple of the most prevalent ones for you. So the first ones that we need to look at, I suppose at the moment really is behaviour in fire. I suppose it's really relevant everything that's going on with Granfield uh, at the moment and the inquiry and the spread of fire. So really, really relevant. Granulomeric distribution. This is about the density of the soil. So have you got a really dense soil or a really loose soil? So if you've got a really, really loose soil, the water will drain through really, really quickly. If you've got a dense soil, you're going to end up with a more uh, boggy substrate. So it depends on what type of planting, what you need. Um, the other thing here I just want to go on quickly is the pH value. So with pH value, it's all too commonplace. People think, oh, I'll specify pH neutral in my soil mix. Um, and that'll be OK. The problem is plants very seldom like pH neutral values. They either want alkaline or acidic. And by putting pH neutral, you're probably not going to be doing yourself any favours. So just to show a point, here is a what they call a naturalised bonsai tree. This tree is 60 years old. Um, it cost the owner twelve and a half thousand pounds, a lot of money for a tree. The soil mix for this cost i think it was uh, just under 300 pounds for the soil mix either 250 or 300 pounds for the soil mix but what i'd rather do is i'd rather get the soil mix right and pay 250 or 300 pounds for the soil rather than at, at the defects page then having to then replant that tree at a cost of 12 and a half plus the soil on top again so always right to look at what the planting needs and provide the soil to sustain that plant life Green roofs can be very, very functional um, as well as decorative. So here, what we're seeing here, this is a pedestrian zone. This is actually a Hilton hotel and underneath here is their main kitchen. So it just shows you the kind of the confidence the architect had at specifying the green roofing, even though it was actually under such a critical part of the hotel. And as you can see, we've got some granite set, steps and we've got some metal railings, some box hedging, some grass areas, and then some sort of trees that are gonna eventually grow up over the side. So again, very, very usable functional spaces. Right, next thing we need to do is talk about is irrigation, drainage and, and outlets. So the introduction of a green roof will dramatically reduce rainwater discharge. So on a roof that doesn't have a green roof, the rule of thumb is sort of for every 100 mil outlet, you'll, you'll probably cover about 125 square metres of roof space or 150 square metres, you're going to need 150 mil outlet. Now, if you put a green roof on, you can double these values. So for every 300 square metres of roof space, you only need 150 mil outlet. Now, why is that important? Well, if you think if you've got a big roof area and you've got lots of internal drainage and you're trying to find room for havoc or high ceilings, lighting, data trays, cabling, by limiting the amount of pipes protruding through the roof, frees up valuable space for, for designers to, to use that space for something else. OK, so extensive seed and blanket roofs generally um, do not require irrigation, but they will provide need a source uh, near the roof level. And the reason being is with seed and blankets, as I'll come and show you a little bit later, um, it's kind of like um, when you roll it out, it's like if you're turfing your lawn at home. So for the first I don't know, month or so, depending on the time you do it, you need to kind of water it every day until the roots establish. Intensive roofs, uh, which is the ones like your back garden, they can lose up to 15 litres per metre squared per day in summer conditions. So they will require an irrigation system. They must, in the design, have a waterproofing, uh, a water point at roof level. So what are your irrigation options? 
So the first one is a float activated maintenance system. That's basically like your system at your toilet at home. It sits on top of the reservoir board. Um, it's, it's usually mains fed. Um, and as the ball cock drops to a certain level, the, the mains feed kicks in and uh, drop, um, tops up the, the drainage board again. There's a continuous drippy leaky pipe system with an automated valve. You've probably seen in you know, garden centres, really. Literally like a perforated pipe. You snake it around the bed and usually have like a battery operated time and it's on an outside tap. Well, now we're seeing now as well, especially on bigger builds and more sort of amenable space, if you like, and these pop up systems. You can get very, very small hydraulic systems now. And if you're thinking about areas that are going to be used frequently for playing on or for people for walking around on and using regularly, it limits that trip hazard because you can put them on timers. So they pop up in the evenings when no, or early in the morning when no one's going to be on the roof and then they pop back about the way again, thus limiting people tripping over them. Other things you can quickly just want to talk about are just things like individual pipe penetrations. Um, you can penetrate green roofs, not, not a problem. It's always good to do it at design stage if you can beforehand, but this is a retro fit, re, retro uh, retrofit one. Sorry, I put my tongue back in my mouth. This is what we call a swan net detail, and that's how you put a cable into a green roof properly. They're not expensive. They're very, very uh, straightforward to install. Most roofing contractors would be able to install one for you. I just wanted to sort of flag that up. So sedum, what is sedum? Sedum is a rocky outcrop and this is what it looks like in its natural environment, growing on the side of a cliff face. This is what it looks like in our commercial grown farms. This is a sedum blanket, it's grown on a crushed coconut shell matting. Rule of thumb here for you guys is to remember really, um, is the rule of three. So from us farming it and rolling it up and getting it to site days before it's laid out again, Anything more than that, the roots will go into shock and when you unroll it, it will be dead. So three days is key. If you're going to write any notes from today, three days for sedum from from farm to site, three days. OK, so sedum blankets and what I want to show you on this slide here is this is sedum blanket and it looks very, very green and luscious. And this is in April. Now, it's really important with clients to ask the question. When they say a green roof, are they meaning green as in environmental aesthetics of a roof or are they meaning green in colour? So this is a seed and blanket in April and this is the same roof in August. As you can see, it's not green. Seed and blanket is very, very seldom green. It's only green for a couple of months of the year. The most of the year it kind of goes uh, pinks when it's uh, flowering and then it kind of goes browns um, and dark tinges um, for the rest of the year. And also, again, note that on the side here, those uniform edges are now gone. It is a rocky outcrop. It will grow over that gravel. It will grow up the side. If you want the uniform finish, what we do is we put a metal re uh, retaining edge in there, a hard edge, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, it has a chemical additive on it. It will stop that from growing over it. So you'll get that nice regimental um, look, uniform look to, to the design. And here's one I can say with the edging in. So as you can see, very crisp, nice, tidy lines. Other options for sedum is plug planting. Plug planting can be a bit of a, a false economy. It's, it's great if, if you, the end client understands that they're going to have a brown roof, you're going to plant a few plugs, but they are going to need to leave it and let it spread across itself. And that's going to take a, um, a few years to do. Where plug planting comes into its own is if you've got areas of damage within sedum. So if, if I remember what like I was saying earlier, sedum can be damaged fairly easily. So if perhaps, I don't know, you've had some unplanned maintenance go on there and the engineers walked over it and killed an area, um, you can go with some plug planting and plant some areas back in and get it to revitalise. Or you can just leave it and eventually the sedum will just uh, grow across and cover up those gaps anyway. So in summary and conclusion, first thing we want to do is the most important thing is we select the plant life first. Then we design a zone to support that life. Then we select a waterproofing system known to be trustworthy in the construction that you're specifying. Pay close attention to the fine details is always the devil is always in the detail. Work with expert um, suppliers. And then I'm going to just quickly show you now if I can just get rid of this is hopefully this video will work. Oh, no. Uh, no, no. Just take my pointer off. Sorry, it's because I still got my pointer on.
Uh, hi, Nick. I think the uh, sound isn't working, even though we tested it beforehand. OK, OK. We, uh, sorry about that. Um, let me. Um, unfortunately, we tested it beforehand and it works absolutely fine. I think it's more to do with teams. And when you've got a larger number of people on teams, for some reason, the sound is whatever reason. I don't know. Um, can can, can, can uh, unfortunately be lost. So let me unshare this and I will come um, and take some questions from you, hopefully. Um, yeah, so I think, um, well, if uh, Nick, if you keep sharing your final screen for a second so everyone okay. can sort of see your uh, contact details. I'm trying to, but it's not letting me do it now. Oh, OK. Um, I don't for some reason. OK, what we'll do is we'll, uh, if you could, uh, uh, provide us the uh, uh, presentation as, as uh, we previously discussed, what we could do is we can form that as part of the email out to everyone that was uh, that basically attended today. Um, we've already got time for uh, one question, so if anyone anyone would like to ask a question, please do just type into the uh, chat box and we can uh, feed that back to Nick. Um, if, if you'd like to uh, ask any questions in the meantime or after this event, then please do contact him directly. Um, he's more than happy to have a chat about any projects of any sizes. Uh, they're currently looking at a project for us at, in our office at the moment. Um, so really helpful, um, uh, really good uh, guys at that end. Um, as you can see here, we've just had our uh, first event, which is CPD and 43 Green Group Technology by More Materials. And then if we switch a slide to the next slide, um, we've got a couple of events coming up just before Christmas break. So we've got an, another CPD in 43, which is uh, force majeure, um, which is in relation to legal issues. It's particularly that have been happening this year in regard to extension of time on contracts, uh, people not meeting contracts, uh, contractual relationships, etc. Um, due to COVID. Um, so that's that's been quite an interesting thing that's happened this year. So that would be something not to be missed. And then following that event, which is on the 2nd of December, we've got another one which is on the 16th of December, which is an, another uh, type of uh, event structure that we've created, which is in discussion with Paul Smith of Ealing Housing, who's also the uh, immediate past um, housing uh, cabinet minister for Bristol City Council. Um, so really interesting guy, known him for quite a long time and it's not to be missed also um, and like i said at the beginning of the event uh, for all of those that joined uh, later on uh, we have created a series of events uh, we currently have a everything booked up until august 2021 um, so we've got a few more slots later on from august onwards to december so please do if you feel like there's something in particular you'd like us to uh, present then please do make that um, aware to anyone in the committee, myself, for example, um, and we will consider and get in touch with the relevant others. Um, so this gives you an example of the events that we've got going on in December, and we've got a couple of interesting events going on in January, just to do a little bit of a leak. Uh, we've got um, a really interesting one uh, early in January, which is uh, a international leader and coach who will be uh, advising people on how to supercharge your CV and job advice, interviews, etc. So on. And then we've got another one to a latter end of January, which is by David Chomisky from Ulster University, who's going to be talking about mental health, etc. So all of these not to be missed. Um, so really happy to see you all. Um, Nick, if you'd like to say any final words before we close off. Just um, thank you for everyone attending today. Um, I believe someone has very kindly put my email address in the um, in the messages on there. So again, like I said, if anyone has any questions, please email me. If you would like certificates, uh, rebra accredited certificates, then please um, email and we'll get those straight over to you. Okay, um, I think again, we've, got, I think we've got two minutes to take a couple of questions. It looks like we've had quite a few come in. So let me just um, go over a couple quickly. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, can we get some info on costing? Uh, do you have lighter systems that uh, and that need uh, lighter maintenance? Do you have Revit families, uh, etc.? So that's sort of. Gosh, yes. Of okay. Um, quite a few questions there, all in one go. So, um, in terms of costings, yes. If you've got an idea of kind of um, 
what sort of build you're doing um, and what kind of designs you like. If you email me, we can happily provide you with some cost indications. That's no problem. Um, in terms of lightweight systems, yes, there are lightweight systems as we went through the, into the in, the in the presentation. It depends on type of substrate you specify and the type of waterproofing membrane you're specifying. And then, yes, we can do lightweight green roof structures on top of that. In terms of maintenance, um, low maintenance then sedums and those types of things are fairly low maintenance as we said but you know bear in mind when they're establishing you do need to water them to, to start with but then after that you pretty much can leave them alone they're a rocky outcrop they want to be left alone um they're kind of grumpy and just you know like hermits who want to be left alone so they're, 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 they're probably your best sort of bets to specify um grasses and things like that are very very needy um they take a lot of feeding and a lot of maintenance so those things you'd want to avoid um, in terms of rivets and, um, and BIM models, um, yes, again, send me some e uh, an email we, and we can get those over to you, it's not a problem. Okay, great. Um, so um, hopefully that everyone's learned a little bit from uh, Nick uh, from Moy about green roofs um, and also, also looked at the um, events that we've got coming up. Please do go into Eventbrite, they should be live on there, the ones that we've currently advertised. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Hopefully you can uh, have some time to uh, have a bit of lunch now and uh, we hope to see you in a couple of weeks time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.